This is America. And even though we're a younger country, we've got a story to tell. Stories of revolution, hope, terror, innovation, and change. We live in a time of historical reckoning, as long-held American myths and stories are being reassessed and recontextualized to include the fuller scope of our history. From black cowboys and cowgirls to an all-black town out west, here are just a few overlooked or often overshadowed stories from America's past and its present. These are hidden histories. Are you gonna move your head? When the murder of George Floyd happened, it just made people want to support black people. It made white equestrians in the horse industry want to support black equestrians. And so like now when everybody's like, oh, black cowboys, black equestrians, black horse people, um, for me it was normal. Like I grew up doing that. People are just blown away by the fact that we have a history in this. Good girl, we're going right across the street to another stall. That's it. Good girl. My dad built this barn and it has 22 stalls in it. This is where I grew up. My dad built the actual barn in 1985. I have eight horses. My dad has three horses and then we rent out stalls and pastures for boarding. So there's roughly maybe 30 something horses here all together. This is Caitlin Gooch. She's an author, an educator, and most importantly, a writer. She's been writing since she was three years old. In the past seven years, she's also built a small community online where she's known as the Black Cowgirl. I use the Black Cowgirl as my stage name because it's simple. Like, I'm black, and when I go to meet kids, they're like, oh, it's a cowgirl. The stereotypical cowboy in America is like this lean white man. And he has Wrangler boots and Wrangler jeans and a 10-gallon cowboy hat. And that is not me. <laughs> As a black cowgirl, Caitlin has gone viral. Let's talk about the very bold and well-respected Mary Fields, also known as Stagecoach Mary. Her goal is to educate people about black Americans' contributions to horse culture, whether via trail riding, horse racing, farming, and as cowboys and cowgirls. <laughs> In 2020, Oprah retweeted her. So I don't know how Oprah found my tweet. She retweeted it, and of course, like that amplified my voice even more and the numbers and my follower count. Today, Caitlin has over 40,000 followers across her accounts. She's been writing most of her life, but it wasn't until she went off to college that Caitlin realized a lot of people weren't aware of black equestrians. We have always been involved in the horse industry and we can be here and we deserve to be here. Black cowboys and cowgirls are often left out of old Western movies and history books. But historians estimate that one in four cowboys of the American West were African-American. Black men, women, and children, both enslaved and free, were among the earliest cowhands on Texas ranches. Black cowboys and cowgirls were essential to the cattle industry, especially out west. They drove herds of cattle across the plains, maintained the land, and worked as ranch hands. One of the most famous cowboys was Nat Love, who was born into slavery in 1854, and as a boy, learned how to rope, herd, and brand cattle and horses. His story was recently featured in the Netflix film, The Harder They Fall. Bill Pickett was also featured in the movie. He was one of the first black rodeo cowboys in the early 1900s. He invented bulldogging, a technique of grabbing cattle by the horns and wrestling them to the ground that is still used today. Finding that history has been pretty cool, but one thing that I haven't been able to find is all the women. Like there's so many cowboys and I found like three women so far. Eliza Carpenter was a formerly enslaved woman who became the only black stable owner in Oklahoma in the early 1900s. 
In 1954, Sylvia Rideout Bishop became the first black woman licensed to train horses in the United States. And in the early 1970s, Cheryl White became the first black woman licensed to jockey in the nation. I, Tracer, races challenge me for the rail position and gets it. In 1875, the very first Kentucky Derby was won by a black jockey, Oliver Lewis. In fact, 15 of the first 28 derbies were won by black jockeys. But by the 20th century, as Jim Crow laws spread in the South, white jockeys demanded segregation and the removal of black jockeys from competition. The one consistent thing that tends to happen is that people ask whose horses are they, like if they see me driving the truck in the trailer, people just automatically assuming that it's someone else's horse which I don't think, I mean, I've asked a couple of white equestrians if that's ever happened to them, and most of them have said no. Whether they're thinking like, oh, it's because she's black, or oh, because she's a woman, or she's a black woman, I just laugh it off, because people have no idea, you know, like how strong I am. You are so beautiful, Rhonda. Novely, have you rode a horse before? Before. You did, you rode it by yourself? Wow. Caitlin is the mother of four and includes her kids in her TikToks. Say Sylvia Bishop. Huh? You've been awake this whole time? Lord. What do y'all want to eat? High five this hand for macaroni, high five this hand for pizza. Which one? Thirsty. You thirsty? All right, let's go get your cup, okay? In 2019, Caitlin started Saddle Up and Read, a nonprofit organization where kids without direct access to a local stable can go to her farm and pet, ride, and read to horses. And I started it to help raise the literacy rates in North Carolina. According to the nation's 2019 report card, only 36% of fourth graders in North Carolina read at a proficient or higher level. As of September 2022, Caitlin has raised about $40,000 with the nonprofit. She's also created her own coloring book to educate kids on black equestrian history. I love to read and I just wanted to pass that on and also the love of horses. Next for me, I'm just really focused on this land that's here. Um, this is all my family's land on both sides. I mean, I just want to continue working towards the future and making this the best Space possible for people and horses. I think it's important for people, not just black people, not just people of color, but even white people to realize that black people have always been a part of this. We're learning about everything else. We should learn about black horse folk too. Start in Los Angeles and get on the I-5 heading north. Drive 150 miles, past Hollywood, past Santa Clarita, and Bakersfield. Eventually, you'll wind up here. The Colonel Allensworth State Park, where for $6, you can park your car and walk through the history of what was once a thriving black community. If you go a little further south, past the park, you'll see what's left of that dream, the community that the park has preserved in time. This is the park. This is our community center, this is the school. I think people think of it in the past. They come to the park and that's all they know. They have no idea that 500 people live here. Allensworth, located in California's Central Valley, was the state's first self-governed black community. The town was established in 1908 by Allen Allensworth, who was born into slavery and later became the first black lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. As the town began to grow, residents built a schoolhouse, barbershop, bakery, and drugstore. Agriculture dominated the economy, and by the 1920s, nearly 300 people lived here. It became a refuge from the racist policies of Jim Crow spreading throughout the country. The community where African Americans could have their own lives free of hostility, but after the colonel's death in 1914, the town began to decline. The railway diverted trains from Allensworth, hurting its economy. And the state broke its promises to providing water to the town, causing a water crisis. In 1974, the town was preserved as the Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park. 
And although a lot of people moved away, there's still a community here. The park is now home to many migrant farm workers and a handful of black families, like Denise's, who are working to revitalize the town. Yeah, that's a picture of Ma. Is that Ma? Yeah, sir. Every meeting she went to, she would say to the people, what about Allensworth? She was a busy lady. Probably still is. <laughs> Despite Allensworth's challenges, it's a town that continues to attract generations of believers, some dedicating their entire lives to continuing its legacy. My mom moved into the town, Nettie Morrison, in 1979. She was an advocate for this town in every way. Many times when people were sick here or lost a loved one, instead of dialing 911, they called my mom. I think when you see something that needs to be done, let's not wait, let's do what must be done. Allensworth is the town that refused to die. Dennis and Denise are twins. Dennis, you keep your little comments to yourself. But y'all the same age. Okay, then. That's all I got to say. I'm six minutes older. That's why I say keep your comments to yourself. They moved to Allensworth in 2010 to continue their mom's work. Working with our uh, boards right now to try to improve the water quality we're getting people have to travel 20 miles anywhere to get food gas anything and there's no work for the community when this this big farmer started selling off his land i i, I bought 60 acres of it presently we are growing oats i'm hoping to create an economic base through agriculture you, you see the these greens coming up, mustard greens. We have collard greens. These are the collard greens right here. For some reason, God sent me and my family here. So I'm trying to do my part. Throughout history, it's been said that African Americans are lazy. And every time the opportunity has come for success, it's been taken away. There have been several successful and self-sufficient black communities in the U.S., but so many of them were destroyed. In some cases, it was through public policy, like when New York's Seneca Village was cleared out to build Central Park. In other cases, through violence, like when white mobs rampaged through black communities in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Wilmington, North Carolina, and Rosewood, Florida. It's racism. And today uh, is a time that uh, people are saying, I want to determine my own future. Come on, go outside. Come on. Here, you want a treat? Here. Here. Come on. So I just want to show this picture. This is a picture of Colonel Allensworth. And he has a town, the vision of the town in his head. I came here in 2009 when my father had just passed away. So I wanted to pick up the torch. John's father, Cornelius Pope, grew up in Allensworth in the 1930s, long after its heyday. He was behind the push to establish the state park. Cornelius also wanted to restore Allensworth's original cemetery, but he died before that could happen. There were people that were pioneers that came here and started this town that were buried there, and they're still buried there. As you can see, there's no police. There's really no law out here. It's just us. For decades, Tulare County had control of the cemetery after its previous owners died. In 2021, Allensworth finally gained ownership, but they still don't have funding to repair it. How could a government allow something like this to happen? We're gonna restore it. We're gonna return this to a place of respect and grace. In late 2021, the California State Parks Department announced a new partnership with an independent investment group to restore the state park and bring more tourism into the area. But Denise says she's fighting to make sure the community is included in those efforts too. Would you really want someone to come into your community and just develop your park and not your town? I was thinking about it just this morning. It's like, how did my mom do all this? But she just kept the engine going. Even though this town has died from what it started out the essence of it was it's a beacon of hope and it's still here this town refuses to die and we will do our part to help it stay alive and thrive
wherever you live in the world, you know, there are, there are historic monuments that we may sometimes take for granted and sometimes, you know, stop us in our tracks and make us think. But they're like bookmarks. They signify, among other things, they signify for us moments or events, people that had some sort of significance in our becoming who we are today as a culture, as, as a civilization, as a society. On this block in New York City sits an unassuming building. It's a little run down and has a leaky roof. But within its walls are more than a century's worth of stories. And it's a major part of the city's African-American history. But its future is uncertain. Colored School Number 4 was a, a racial caste school that was part of the Board of Education's public school system from 1860 until 1894. Built around the 1850s, 128 West 17th Street started out as a school for white students. But by 1860, it became a school for black children and was partly inspired by the African Free School that was founded in the 1780s as a way to educate the children of free and enslaved black people. At the time, Colored School Number 4 was one of roughly half a dozen all-black schools in Manhattan. So a day in the life of the school would be typical for any school student. A full day of classes. The evening classes, of course, would have been for adults. But the school also had community programs like speaker series and what have you. So whether or not you were a student, uh, even if you were just a community member, you might have reason to spend some time in the building. Colored School Number 4 educated students and served as a community hub and it protected children during one of the city's bloodiest episodes. In 1863, during the Civil War, white mobs ravaged the city in protest of new draft rules. Over several days, black people were murdered and black institutions were destroyed. During the draft riots, teachers at Colored School Number 4 had to barricade the doors to protect the children from a white mob trying to get inside. The building had stopped being a school by 1894, and for much of the 20th century, the Department of Sanitation used it for a staff break room. For the last several years, Eric K. Washington, a writer and independent historian, has advocated for the preservation of Colored School No. 4. He's petitioned the city to grant the building landmark status, acknowledging its history and shielding it from demolition. A building that has this kind of history, this kind of human history that's connected to it, is so rare and it's becoming rarer in the city that is constantly reinventing itself and growing and, and erasing itself, but in some ways shooting itself in the foot. The landmarking process is ongoing, but there is precedent. In Williamsburg, Brooklyn, former Colored School Number 3 has been landmarked since 1998. I think a lot of people don't realize that black history in New York goes back centuries, and people have a tendency to think blacks, New York, Harlem, which is not an illogical thought. It's a logical thought, you know, <laughs> but it's only, it's only a, a piece of a story. It's one of the reasons why I think it's important to treasure this place because it, it reminds us that the breadth of the African-American experience in the city is not just relegated to one corner of Upper Manhattan. In a dream world, Eric says the building would become a cultural center or a museum. But for now... Buildings that speak to us in this way get us asking questions. And I don't think the answers are, are as important as being prompted with new questions, you know, new inquiries to make about our lives. It just seems to wave its, you know, to flag us down and, and, and say, stop, look, listen. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.